This is the time in our service where we partake in the Lord's table. We celebrate communion together. And this morning, we're going to look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1 as we do that. If you need a Bible, we are almost out of our Bibles to give away, but we have a few left. And if you need one, we'd love to get one in your hand. We have some men on the sides who will come down the aisle. You can just raise your hand and we'll get what we have to you. If we don't have enough, you can share with the person next to you. Each time we take a little bit of time in our service to take communion together. This time is for us to remember our Savior, Jesus. And so we take a cracker, and the men will come and hand that out in just a moment, which signifies or represents Christ's body. And we take a small cup of juice, which is a picture for us, a reminder for us of Jesus' blood that was shed that was spilt out upon the cross. And these are helpful, tangible reminders for us. As Christians, we are called to remember intentionally Jesus and what he has done in the gospel. We are to remember that Jesus, who is God in the flesh, the second person of the triune God, he came to earth, took on flesh, and lived a perfect life. In accordance to the law, and then he went to the cross willingly under false pretense and was crucified. He was crushed there on the cross. And on the cross, he took upon himself the punishment for the sin of all who would believe in him and in his sacrifice for all who repent of their sins and turn to Jesus in faith. We now have forgiveness of sins. We have reconciliation to God. We are no longer under God's wrath. We are no longer under God's condemnation, but we are now at peace with God. And this is truly a a wonderful reality for all who believe in the name of Jesus. In 1 Corinthians, Paul summarizes this, what I've just described as the gospel, as saying it's the word of the cross. The word of the cross. And I want you to read with me as we prepare our hearts to take communion together. Two verses from chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Two verses. Starting in verse 18. Starting in verse 18. 1 Corinthians 1. Paul says this. For the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the cleverness of the clever I will set aside. There's a contrast here in these verses. The word of the cross is the power of God for those who are being saved. It is God's means of bringing people to himself. It is an exclusive means. There's no other way that someone gets to God but through the word of the cross, which is the gospel. And to the world, it is foolishness. That's the contrast. It is the wisdom of God, and yet to the world, it is foolishness. That is, it is moronic. It is absolute nonsense to those who rely upon their own wisdom. Man's wisdom would never lead to salvation coming in the way that God has ordained it. Never lead to that. Man's wisdom would never lead to salvation coming in the way that God ordained it. Yet God's wisdom is supreme, far above man's. In fact, there is an infinite divide between God's thinking and man's thinking. And the gospel message, the word of the cross, is God's plan and provision for man's redemption, for salvation. For reconciliation. And then in verse 19, Paul uses a quotation from Isaiah 29, 14. He says, For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the cleverness of the clever I will set aside. To emphasize that the wisdom of men will be destroyed. Isaiah's teaching will have its ultimate fulfillment in the last day when all men's philosophies and objections to the gospel will be done away with by Christ. But here, Paul uses it to demonstrate that God's wisdom is superior and puts the wisdom of man to shame. God's wisdom is so supreme, so superior, that it just obliterates the wisdom of the wise of this world. God's wisdom is put on display in the gospel message, in the word of the cross. In the gospel, God's plan of redemption is the clearest display of his wisdom. 
And for us who have repented of our sins, he has provided reconciliation and eternity with him through it. Does this means of salvation, this way of thinking that God would send his own son to take the punishment that we deserve so that we might be reconciled in forgiveness, does this make sense to the world or worldly thinking? No, it doesn't. Yet in the gospel, in the word of the cross, we see that God's wisdom is supremely trustworthy. That his wisdom is far above our own, that we would never come to the conclusion that this way of salvation is right or good, and yet it is what he has chosen to use as the means of reconciliation for man to himself. And in the cross, in the word of the cross, in the gospel, we see that God's wisdom is supremely trustworthy. I want you to just ponder that for a moment as we prepare to remember our Savior's death. Remember that his wisdom in the gospel is supremely trustworthy. In the gospel, in the word of the cross, God has demonstrated his wisdom to be supremely trustworthy. And if you can trust him for your salvation through a supremely wise means that your wisdom would have never led you to, how much more can you trust his wisdom in whatever trials, in whatever struggles, and whatever difficulty, and whatever hardship, and whatever sin that you might find yourself in this morning, you can trust him. Where relationships are difficult, you, you can trust him this morning. Where circumstances are trying, you can trust him where you are acutely aware of your own weakness, you can trust him. Where you feel disheartened or, or downcast, you can trust him. Believer, God loves you. He is near to you. He wants good things for you. He will never leave you or forsake you. He's working all things for your good and for his glory. And he has you where you are this morning in his wisdom. What more could he do to demonstrate his trustworthiness to us than giving his own son? We can trust him this morning. And his instruction to you from scripture that, that you are struggling to submit yourself to, even now, you can trust him. Where there is, is sin in your life that maybe God is bringing to mind right now that you have not repented of yet and you don't want to let go to, of it. You think, you think it is better, but God says it's not. You can trust his wisdom and repent. As we remember Christ's body that was crushed and his blood that was shed, it's, it's a time to remember. It's also a time to examine I encourage you now in, in just a few moments as the men come to think, are there areas where you are trusting in your own wisdom above God's, where you're chafing against God's instruction, where you're not wanting to wholly embrace what he has called you to be and do in life's various circumstances, or are there just hardships that you're in right now and, and you need to trust yet again yourself into the care of our great Savior? And examining yourself, if you discover that there is sin that you haven't repented of, I encourage you, begin that process of repentance now and take the bread and the cup and remember and rejoice in our great Savior with us. Submit yourself to God and his superior wisdom. For those of you that don't know Jesus, who, who have not submitted yourself to God's superior wisdom and the gospel and the word of the cross, I would plead with you this morning, do so now. Repent, turn, turn from trusting in yourself and your own methods and your own means to appease your conscience and try to make yourself right with God. Turn, turn from that kind of thinking and submit yourself to God's wisdom in the gospel. Humble yourself before the Lord, and if you would do that, take the bread and the cup with us. But if you refuse, if you're not a believer, we would ask that you simply let the bread and, and the cup pass, as this is a time for believers to remember our Savior together, and then find someone 
come talk to me, anyone here, about the truth of the gospel that you've heard this morning. You must. The men are going to come now and serve the bread and the cup and take them and consider these things. And when your heart is prepared, take and remember our Savior. And I'll come up in a few moments and we'll pray and continue in our morning.